So welcome to our conference sponsored by the Harvard Journal of Law and Policy um, on the Electoral College. I'm Larry Lessig, and I begged the Harvard Journal to do this conference, and they did the best favor possible by having an extraordinary leader, Margaret, who took it over and did absolutely everything without any input from me. It's the perfect delegation um, I admire greatly uh, their skill because I wouldn't have been able to do anything close to what they've done here. So we're very happy to see such a diverse group of scholars about the ideas that we will talk about with the Electoral College. And we're going to begin with Danielle Root, who's from the Center for American Progress, to kick us off. Um, and at the end, um, uh, we will have a similar wrapping up um, uh, outside of the context of the panels that will be presented. So Danielle, I'd love to invite you to come forward. Good morning. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank Harvard Law School um, and especially the Harvard Law and Policy Review for holding this very important event on an issue that is so critical to our democracy. The outcomes of the 2000 and 2016 presidential elections have raised public awareness and criticism of the Electoral College to a level rarely enjoyed by similarly arcane institutions. While past efforts to reform the Electoral College have failed, reform advocates have good reason to believe that the time is now ripe for real systematic change. But it's important to recognize that the issues being raised today and which will be debated and explored at this conference, have long been the subject of debate in the United States, beginning with the Founding Fathers and up through today. At various points since the nation's founding, lawmakers and advocates have questioned the democratic legitimacy of the Electoral College, calling for reform and in some cases for its elimination. Particularly over the last century, new ideas, such as the National Popular Vote Compact, have gained new prominence in the debate. And in fact, we have a whole panel dedicated to this idea later this afternoon. Today, the Electoral College has become a regular topic of conversation within communities across the country, in the halls of Congress, and on the presidential campaign trail. Politicians from both parties do everything they can to win under the current rules, while accusing reformers and traditionalists alike of naked partisanship. For their part, scholars and historians disagree over the institution's soundness, as well as the practicality and wisdom of continuing to rely on it for future elections. And everyday Americans who increasingly feel that their votes and voices do not matter in our elections grapple to understand how the Electoral College impacts their power as voters. The questions being asked by politicians, scholars, and the American people about the validity and fairness of the Electoral College are central to determining its future place in our democracy. Key among them are, why was the Electoral College created in the first place, and what was its envisioned purpose? What impact does the Electoral College have on the health and integrity of US elections? And what risks does it pose to democratic stability? <laughs> Finally, is there a right way to go about reforming the Electoral College? Do we go for small scale change, eliminate it entirely, or leave the process as is? The US Constitution ascribes a unique process for electing the President of the United States. Via the Electoral College, the president is not elected through popular vote, but rather by state electors who are apportioned to the states according to their respective representation in Congress, so that each state is guaranteed at least three electors. To win an election, a presidential candidate must simply win a majority of votes in the Electoral College. Today, that means 270 of 538 votes. But why was this system created in the first place? Like many issues related to the Electoral College, the question has been vigorously debated, including by the framers themselves, and ultimately, there wasn't truly any one reason. 
In part, the Electoral College was born out of a need to placate small and large states who disagreed over equal and proportional democracy. But it was also a compromise between those who thought the president should be elected by the people and those who believed he or she should be elected by Congress. In fact, many framers believed, and perhaps even hoped, that the Electoral College would often fail to reach majority consensus on presidential candidates. As such, the matter would be delegated to the US House of Representatives, which would ultimately decide who became president. This theory begs the question of whether the framers envisioned the Electoral College playing any significant role at all in our electoral process. Others argue the Electoral College reflects the framers' distrust in the American people's ability to make informed political decisions, while still others assert it simply offered a practical solution to holding elections for national office during a time when reliable transportation and national periodicals were lacking. Finally, we cannot ignore the very real and still very relevant debate about race and power that birthed the Electoral College and our system of federal representation. At the time of its creation, the Electoral College was directly interwoven with the infamous three-fifths clause, allocating outsized power to slaveholding states that considered African Americans property. And while slavery has ended, the Electoral College still tends to award greater influence to states that are predominantly white at the expense of those with more diverse populations. In reality, the framers' motivation behind creating the Electoral College is likely some combination of all of the above. Yet despite disagreement over how and why the Electoral College came to be, most experts agree that the intent was that the president would reflect the preferences of the majority of American voters. But as we know, this is not how things have always panned out, with real consequences for public faith in our elections. The 2016 election was the most recent example of discrepancies between the US popular vote and the Electoral College, where in presidential candidate Hillary Clinton received nearly 3 million more votes nationwide than now President Donald Trump. Yet, because of vote allocations within the Electoral College, she ultimately lost the presidency. But 2016 was not the first time mismatched election results occurred. Since the nation's founding, the Electoral College has caused four other presidents to ascend into office despite having lost the popular vote. Such anomalies have now occurred in two of the last five presidential elections. Soon, such occurrences may not be considered anomalies at all. A recent study from the University of Texas suggests that in future close elections, the less popular presidential candidate has a 45% chance of winning the Electoral College and thus the presidency. Beyond these specific outcomes, the design of the Electoral College runs counter to the principle of one person, one vote. By granting voters in smaller, less populated states significantly more voting power and influence over electoral outcomes than voters in large, more populous states. Because of how the Electoral College is apportioned, voters in Wyoming currently have three times more voting power in presidential elections than voters in California. The Electoral College may also be contributing to rising disillusionment among American voters and their belief that their votes don't matter. This is because of what's often referred to as the 50% plus one rule and wasted votes. This problem is particularly poignant for voters in deep blue or deep red states where one candidate can easily win with minimal investment by his or her campaigns. Furthermore, the Electoral College is facing a reckoning with its racist origins. As jurisdictions across the country tear down Confederate statutes and do away with celebrating Columbus Day in favor of recognition of the first peoples, do we cut against our own credibility as a country that values equality if we fail to dismantle processes born out of and that perpetuate structural racism? But the Electoral College is not without merit. These debates would not have lingered for so long if the case were so clearly one-sided. At least in theory, 
the Electoral College does offer a certain layer of protection against the so-called democratic mob. So far, we as a nation have been lucky to experience an upward trajectory in regard to human and civil rights and the implementation of positive democratic norms. But over the last three years alone, we've seen a rise in xenophobic rhetoric and dangerous shows of American exceptionalism. White supremacy groups have been emboldened to carry out violent attacks, often against historically underrepresented groups, while everyday Americans harboring harmful prejudices have globbed onto politicians whom they believe share and reflect similar sentiment. The drastic rise in racist sentiment and hate-filled behavior witnessed over the last few years does raise questions over the coming political and societal trajectory of the country. In such a situation, could an electoral college made up of calmer, more tolerant electors serve to hold back our worst impulses? Perhaps the most powerful argument against reform is the uncertainty of how reform would actually play out. In other words, is there a risk of the cure being worse than the disease? Because a constitutional amendment is nothing short of impossible today, any reform must derive from the states. With that in mind, should states enter into agreements to dedicate all of their electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote, or should they simply alter their own practices by making their electoral votes proportional to state vote counts? They could also follow in the footsteps of Maine and Nebraska and assign electors specific districts dictating how they must cast their votes. None of these options are a panacea. If you thought recounts in one or two states a year were bad, imagine the logistical nightmare of trying to recount a razor thin national popular vote. Apportioning electors to the states through the Electoral College also makes it easier to isolate and audit potential fraud or foreign or domestic cyber attacks. Under the current system, one state's failure to secure its infrastructure does not necessarily compromise our, election, our electoral system as a whole. And any state-by-state -state reform poses significant issues for partisans on one side or the other. A state that unilaterally decides to apportion its electors between multiple candidates dilutes the strength of the plurality party. Thus, perhaps the option of doing nothing at all with hopes that the system corrects itself is our most viable way forward. All of which to say is that today's event on the utility and future of the Electoral College is both essential and extremely timely. I would like to once again thank the Harvard Law and Policy Review for holding this conference. I would also like to thank in advance the other panelists and speakers for sharing their insight and expertise today and all of you for your attention. Thank you. So we're going to move right to the first panel. Um, after I apologize for the second time referring to the journal in the wrong frame, the review, the Harvard Law and Policy Review, not the Harvard Journal for Law and Policy. Um, I apologize for my ignorance, but my apology is long enough to get everyone up here. Welcome, Sean. <laughs> um, so I, I, I assume, Ned, you're going to start? Sure. OK, thank you. Um, can you all hear me OK out there? Good, all right. Um, I'm Ned Foley, and I'm, I'm going to kind of moderate this panel and, and lead it off and uh, try to keep the introductions really short. Um, we've got two law professors on the panel, Fritnita and myself. If you can read these signs, you see that Fritnita is at USC, and I'm at Ohio State. Um, we are both uh, trained as lawyers, but we uh, try to work and dabble in history as, as part of our scholarship on elections and electoral processes. So we're really thrilled to have two of the most uh, preeminent historians in America, uh, Jack Rakoff and Sean Willens here, um, who need no introduction. Uh, Jack's an honorary law professor for his work on Madison and uh, the original intent of the Constitution, having won a Pulitzer Prize. And I hope everybody knows uh, Sean's uh, Rise of American 
Democracy, which won the Bancroft Prize. And um, I've recently, uh, can I say I read your book, uh, The Politicians and the Egalitarians? So I listened to it on Audible, and I recommend <laughs> audible.com because you can multiply the number of books you can read in a year just by listening to some. And it was actually a great listen, so I encourage you to, oh, you. Uh, oh. to have that uh, book. And then um, <coughs> Sam is, uh, well, Sam's a Renaissance man. He, uh, uh, he's at Princeton. He's trained as That's, a. You mean not a law professor? <laughs> no, I mean everything. You know, the, 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 say something about me. Is that the idea? Uh, no, no, no. Um, not a historian. Uh, he's trained as what a neuroscientist, but he's done incredible work in our field in the on the topic of ger gerrymandering, applying math and and statistics. And um, I'm just waiting for him to. Uh, Solve the impossibility of can you know the arrows theorem and actually find a solution to that. And uh, when he does that, he will really have fixed the American democracy for for all of us. Um, so, the order, which hopefully will be apparent based on uh, the structure of the book I'm about to talk about, it will be Jack, Sean, Sam, and Fernita. Um, but let me give you an overview because they've been kind enough to take a look at a book that I've uh, written that's coming out in December. Uh, and the book has three parts. Uh, the first part uh, is why we have our current electoral college. And the key point is that our electoral college is not the electoral college that was adopted in the summer of Philadelphia in 1787. That was the first electoral college. But it was replaced by the second electoral college, uh, adopted first by Congress in 1803, then ratified by the states in 1804 in time for Thomas Jefferson's reelection in 1804. Um, when I went to law school, I was taught by my professors that the 12th Amendment was just a technical tweak, a fix. It wasn't really important. There was nothing deep or philosophical ab about it. That is not true. Um, having now gone through the records uh, of the Congress that uh, drafted the, the 12th Amendment. It was a rich, robust, thorough debate about the fundamental philosophical principles of American democracy after four experiences of the first system. And so it was a renegotiation of federalism and republicanism. And, and it was, again, these are not household names that were in Congress at the time. Uh, so it wasn't Hamilton and it wasn't Madison. Um, but it was, if you will, the Larry Tribes and the Ern Chemerinskys of the day, um, uh, people who wrote constitutional treatises on, on the Constitution and constitutional governance and jurisprudence as it existed then. Um, the debates are much more extensive uh, than, the, than the debates in Philadelphia at the, at the founding. Madison himself acknowledged late in life that they hurried uh, when they got to the topic of the Electoral College in Philadelphia, and they're, they're kind of trying to get home at the end of a long, hot summer, and they didn't give it the attention it deserved. And you can sort of tell that by, by looking at what the historical record of 1787 and then comparing it to the historical record of 1803. So to understand the difference between these two Electoral Colleges, the, the easiest way to do is to think about the image of what the legitimate, authentic winner that each system had in mind. So the original Electoral College had George Washington at, in mind as the right kind of winner. And what that was was a consensus president, a president who would rise above party, above factions, above interest group politics to govern the nature. And they designed a system for that, that purpose. Again, we all know from the Federalist Papers they hope to avoid permanent two-party conflict and, and have a divide-and-conquer strategy to the problem of faction through separation of powers and other instruments of constitutional architecture. That obviously failed, failed very quickly. By 1792, Madison is writing why he's a member of a political party and we need political parties. By 1796, we get an intensely partisan two-party conflict that gets replicated with great calamity in 1800. And we know what it's like today to live in a world of, of intense polarized um, hyperpartisanship. They were living in that world uh, in 1800 and 1796. It wasn't exactly the same as our system, but it was uh, the, the original idea of avoiding two-party conflict had, uh, had obviously failed. And, um, and the key point is that when they rewrote the Electoral College and the 12th Amendment, they had in mind the inevitability of two-party conflict 
and the key idea was that the majority party pr should prevail. So their, the, their image of an authentic winner is Thomas Jefferson. That's why I call it the Jeffersonian Electoral College, because it is a different beast. And um, they, their point is that there's two parties. There's the Jeffersonian party and the opponents, the Federalist party. And in the, uh, there's never going to be consensus again. <laughs> uh, and at least the majority party should prevail. The chief executive of the United States should not belong to the minority party. But it's also important, that, so, the, so when we, we have to distinguish between majority rule, <coughs> above 50%, versus plurality winners. As we'll get to later on, the defect of our current system, which is abandoned, the Jeffersonian vision is that we can now have plurality winners that replicate the phenomenon of minority rule. That's not what they wanted. They believed in majority rule. You have to have a majority of electoral votes to win. If not a majority of electoral votes, a majority of states in the House. They thought majority winners would win at the state level. And they, because they were combining <coughs> and rethinking putting together Republican form of government, uh, Republican elections, and federalism. They didn't want just a monolithic national majority winner. They wanted a federal majority winner or, or a compound majority winner. The way Thomas Jefferson was going to authentically win, they, they thought he had won authentically in 1800 and almost been deprived of it. They wanted to assure that he would win again properly and the system would work as it, they intended it to. Um, in 1804 was he would accumulate an electoral college majority by amassing state-based majorities. He would be the majority preferred candidate in enough states to produce this federal majority. And in fact, Jefferson and Madison themselves changed the rules for how Virginia appointed electors in 1800 because they knew that states had the power to assure that the winner of the state's electoral votes would reflect majority point of view, not minority point of view within the state. So their vision was this idea of a compound uh, majority, uh, majority winner. And, um, and that's, again, it, they, they, were, they were a party trying to achieve a partisan goal, but they also had philosophical views uh, as to what they wanted to achieve. Now, obviously, their conception of democracy was not our one person, one vote, post Reynolds versus Sims, post 19 Amendment suffrage for everybody. But they had a conception of, of Republican government electoral choice where they wanted the, the majority of the electors to win at the state level and, and, at, the, uh, and at the federal level. They, they were aware that states could appoint electors by popular vote, and they knew that states like Massachusetts and New Hampshire assured that in a popular vote for electors, that there would be runoffs. This is something I didn't realize until I did the research for the book, because states didn't want to just let somebody be an elector with a mere plurality. You needed to have a runoff, whether it was in the form of a popular runoff or a legislative runoff, because they thought that legislatures could, could reflect majority sentiment. Um, so the, the moving now sort of to part two of the, the book, um, What's happened is there's a second story, which is we've abandoned this majority rule principle that was built into the 12th Amendment and the, and the Jeffersonian vision there. And this is a somewhat of a messy, complicated story. And it sort of takes place um, in the Jacksonian era between 1824 and 1844. I know uh, Professor Willens is going to talk about the 1844 election, which is I think one of the most uh, poorly understood consequential election in American history, I certainly in high school never learned about. This was uh, James Polk versus Henry Clay, for those of you who are keeping track. Um, but uh, the point was that states started to abandon this conception of majority rule at the state level and the appointment of their electors. And you can see this most by focusing on New York, which was a big state and the pivotal swing state of the era. And there's a fascinating debate that takes place in the New York State Legislature on the eve of the 1824 election, where one side is clinging, and they prevail for a while, but they ultimately lose after Jackson comes to power. But prior to 1824, the old guard essentially, um, and some a guy named uh, Ariza Flagg. I had never heard of him, but he's a leader of the state legislature in, in New York. And he's explaining why um, 
you know, there's different ways to achieve majority choice at the state level. Um, again, it could be a legislative runoff, it could be a popular runoff, it could be a districting system, but the one thing you don't want, because it would be inconsistent with the 12th Amendment and the, and the Republican Jeffersonian vision, is you do not want a statewide plurality winner to capture all of a state's electoral votes, because that would let minority control of the state outcome and be uh, inappropriate. That view prevails going into the election of 1824, which you may remember it, it is a four-way split uh, that ends up going to the House of Representatives. Jackson comes back with a vengeance. Um, he is, in fact, the majority winner under the Jeffersonian ideals, but the, the sort of philosophies of the times change. And unfortunately, it's a kind of a messy story. They, Jackson sort of himself says he believes in majority rule, but what gets put in place at the state level is plurality winner take all, where you can win all of a state's electoral votes with under 50% of the popular vote. And this has great significance for the first time in the election of 1844. Um, I'll let Sean go into the details of, of, of that. It's a fascinating story. The, I think the question to ask is relevant to it is, is, is 1844 the first time we see a third party candidate affect the result between the two main contenders, kind of like Ralph Nader in 2000. Was there, some, was there a Ralph Nader affecting the election of 1844? And if so, what did they react to? There's a chapter in my book that goes into the surprise that people felt when Polk won in the way that he did, and they called him a minority president, even, even though he won the Electoral College, it didn't go to the House, but they didn't see him as an authentic winner because of what happened in the state of New York with his plurality only victory. Um, and uh, the good news is that for the most part, the system has produced winners that fit the original Jeffersonian vision, meaning candidates do accumulate their state wins with majority wins in the states to achieve an electoral college majority. So it's rarely that we've had elections that, um, no, thank you, that uh, affect uh, the outcome. But, it, but, but there are these ones that we really need to examine closely. And the key philosophical point here to keep in mind is a system designed for two-party competition, the 12th Amendment, can't handle the presence of third parties and independent candidates. It doesn't know what to do, and they didn't design it that way. And they, the first system hoped no parties, just George Washington. The second system thinks there will be team A, team B, and the majority team should win over the minority team. And the, the unfortunate reality of where we are today is we have a kind of national schizophrenia where we're neither an authentic two-party system that is really just team red and team blue because we do have third, fourth, fifth candidates that can affect the system. But we're not also an authentic multi-party system because we, we have a kind of schizophrenia um, and it's because of the mismatch between the design of the 12th Amendment which calls for two-party elections and what happens at the state level which allows for additional candidates but not in a way that was coherently designed or, or properly uh, developed. Um, I need to, to run my comments short so we can get reactions for other people. The, a couple of key takeaways on, on this, um, and I think Sam may talk a way that's relevant. The, the, the pathology that exists now has become more acute in the last quarter century and has the potential between even more so. Because 19, and this is a nonpartisan point, because 1992, Bill Clinton, 2000, George W. Bush, and 2016, Donald Trump, were all candidates who can only get an electoral college majority by winning state-based pluralities. Bill Clinton in 92 won only one state with a majority of the popular vote, his home state of Arkansas and the District of Columbia. Every other state that he wins, he's under 50%, sometimes he's under 40%. It's because of Ross Perot. Now, was Ross Perot a spoiler? Was Ross Perot like Ralph Nader? The political scientists can, can debate that. The, the key point is we don't know for sure, and it's a factor, and our system can't handle a Ross Perot. It can't handle a Jill Stein. It can't handle a Gary Johnson. 
Um, Trump's Electoral College win is with sub-50% wins in seven states. We all know about Ralph Nader in 2000, so I don't need to go into the details. Um, and this could happen again. If you were watching the news yesterday, you know, there, people are worried that there's going to be another third-party candidate, whether it's Justin Amash of the Libertarian Party or uh, Lincoln Chafee, the Libertarian Party nominee, or Michael Bloomberg decides to re-enter the race, or Tulsi Gabbard, or yada, yada, yada. Right? I mean, we do not have a system that matches the sense of two-party competition with the reality that there may be multiple candidates on the ballot. What's the solution? The solution is for states. Each, you don't need a, a constitutional amendment. You don't need a multi-state compact. What you need is the pivotal states. It'd be nice if all the states did this, but if the battleground states adopted a majority requirement, I mean, you cannot get all of a state's electoral votes unless you cross the 50% threshold of the popular vote, that would solve the problem. There's different specific ways of doing that. My own preference is ranked choice voting, like Maine has just adopted for presidential electors. So because ranked choice voting is an instant runoff, so that you ha if you have a third, fourth, fifth candidate on the ballot, the mathematics of it will get you a genuine majority winner. But if you don't like that, you could do a regular old-fashioned runoff of a second vote, like, a, um, like France does with its presidential elections. You just have a second runoff a few weeks later. It would be logistically a little messy in our system, but it, it's not infeasible. And it's certainly constitutionally permissible for states to do under Article Two, because that's exactly what Massachusetts and New Hampshire did pro, you know, for a long, long time, well into the middle of the 19th century. Um, other states did it as well. Uh, it, you could have um, a kind of a, a, a version designed for the presidential system of the so-called top two primary that California uses and Washington State uses for gubernatorial and other elections. You could do something called conditional winner-take-all, where you get all of the electoral votes from a state if you reach 50% or more, but if no candidate is above 50%, then you do statewide proportionality uh, division of the electoral vote. So there are lots of different ways to do it, but any of those ways would avoid this kind of schizophrenic pathology that we have in our current system. And just think about how consequential it would be if just a couple of states did this. If only Florida had adopted this reform prior to 2000, never would have needed to worry about hanging chads or butterfly ballots because um, you would have had a, an essentially a runoff between George W. Bush and Al Gore. And, and I think it's pretty clear what would have happened there. If mathematically, if only Michigan and Florida had done this before 2016, then the question is who would have won the runoffs um, in those two states between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump? If Clinton had won those runoffs, I don't know that she would have, but if she had, then she would have achieved an electoral college majority, not Donald Trump. So what happens at the state level, this choice between plurality versus majority is absolutely crucial to the functioning of the electoral college. The current system is not functioning because of the subsequent introduction of plurality winner take all that occurred after 1824 and that was not part of the original vision of the 12th Amendment. That's the essence of the book. Well, we could give him a round of applause for yeah, right. <laughs> So this is a, you know, it's a fascinating book. <clears throat> it raises uh, questions I think that many of us who've thought serious about the Electoral College have not taken sufficiently seriously uh, to this point. And so it encourages, or perhaps even forces one to rethink some of the underlying premises uh, that, we've, uh, that we've brought to the analysis. Uh, I think our job here, Larry, I hope this is okay with you, is we should, we should offer you know, some set of reflections based on our own particular commitments, mine are mostly to the late 18th century, very early 19th century period, and then perhaps to offer some general reflections on Ned's overall thesis. And I think, I think Ned gave a very apt summary, uh, which allows us, in effect, to, to cut to the chase uh, pretty quickly and you know, get some subsequent points out there, then leave plenty of time for debate. So I want to just restate, uh, you know, or read a single sentence, <clears throat> which, I, which I think encapsulates Ned's uh, basic position. It comes, I didn't write down the page number, but it's, it's right up there in the introduction. So what Ned wants is um, a distinctive kind of majority winner 
suitable for a federal republic, and I want to emphasize that phrase, suitable for a federal republic, because I want to come back and criticize that conception uh, at the end of my remarks. A compound majority in which a majority vote in the Electoral College itself is achieved by securing a majority vote in the states that created the, the Electoral College majority. It's a little formulaic, but I think it captures uh, the essential argument. Um, so first off, I, you know, I, I think that has done a terrific job by saying you know, we, we need to distinguish more clearly uh, the pre-1803, 1804 regime from, from its predecessor. I, I would quibble with the idea that selecting George Washington is, is actually TISA 1, is really the first stage. I, to me, the Electoral College debates are always about a post-Washington world. So long as Washington wants to be president, it doesn't matter what rules you have. <laughs> You'll always get the same result. Uh, and that's, I think, federal supporters like Alexander Hamilton, Governor Morris, and you know, other of Washington's friends, Madison as well, um, would have been committed to that proposition. And the first thing to realize about that is as soon as you have a contested election in 1796, and if you don't know what Jeff Paisley, P-A-S-L-E-Y, Jeff Paisley's recent book on this is really a, you know, a great illumination. Even though Washington delays the announcement of his retirement as long as he can in a, in a kind of futile effort to subdue party conflict, as soon as he announces his retirement, both parties were highly mobilized. Uh, to operate within within the within the electoral system, uh, and I think you know the first discovery of that is there were no there. I don't think there, there were no independent electors in 1796. So the partisan commitments dominated ab initio uh, from from the beginning, uh, and I think I think Ned also, although he discusses, I don't think he pays adequate attention to the amount of partisan manipulation of electoral rules that took place uh, between 1796 and 1800. You discuss it a bit. I actually. Thought there was more to say. Okay, so but uh, you know I like the overall thesis uh, 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 of the book. I, I, I might add that I think it might pay more attention to how the winner take all equil uh, equilibrium you know was attained. I think more or less by the 1820s. Uh, you know it has become the dominant rule with the Nebraska and Maine being the default options. But those are just my preliminary remarks. Let me um, let me go back. I want to say something about. Um, the Origins of the Electoral College, something I've written about extensively in a variety of places. And every four years, I go on my own mini campaign uh, for a national popular vote. You know, not, not to be done through the compact, which I know we'll discuss this afternoon, which I think is a fatally flawed idea. And you know, I think uh, you know, I, for a variety of reasons, I think this will come up later. I'm, I'm just an Article 5 constitutional amendment guy, even though Jimmy Carter once told me personally, you know, two, 200 years from now, we'll still have the Electoral College. Uh, in, its, in, in its current form. So the deep historical point I want to make is that I think it's important to understand the limitations of 1787. And the fundamental limitation affecting the framers of the Constitution was that there was no model available uh, for the kind of national Republican executive, it's always lowercase r, the kind of national Republican executive they wanted to create. The dominant models of executive power available in the 18th century were either monarchical or ministerial in nature. And the framers of the Constitution had rejected both, you know, as matters of principle. Um, you know, monarchy obviously was out for, you know, some obvious reasons. Uh, but those of you know, who know the work of my mentor, uh, uh, Bud Balin, who I, I hope to see yesterday, but circumstances intervened, uh, know as well that the idea of ministerial government uh, was all, it, you know, had, had also been rejected. So, you know, for, you know, for the get-go, I think we need to cut the framers some slack uh, and I say this not as an apologist for what they were doing, but I think we need to cut them some slack by realizing and appreciating the difficulty of what it was they were they they they, they were trying to achieve. Uh, they're just you know the, of all the institutions the framers created, I, I think it's important to say this in a law school surrounding. It was not the Supreme Court, you know, Pache, Alexander, Bickle, and others, you know, and other commentators. The Supreme Court was not the great, and the idea of judicial review was not the greatest innovation. The idea of having a national Republican executive was. The presidency is actually the single most dynamic institution uh, in the American constitutional system, and the question of how it be selected, uh, therefore, posed in its own way, uh, you know, the you know the most decisive challenge. The extension of this, which I think is critical to understand, um, is the Electoral College. And again, that phrase is anachronistic; it comes into use only in. But yeah, you know, we use it all the time, so why not here? You know, as shorthand. But I think I think Alex says it's kind of late nineteenth, early twentieth yes. century right. uh, linguistic linguistic innovation. Um, it's important to understand there was not adopted as the most attractive alternative available, but as the least unattractive. In other words, it was not it was not adopted on the basis of its merits. It was just adopted on the basis of its superiority to the other obvious modes of electing a president. 
There are two other obvious modes. One would, one would be to have popular election that suffers uh, two critical defects. One is the regional one, which Madison advanced, but then abandoned, that if you actually have a national popular election in a single constituency, which is what a true national popular election would entail, let's call it the United States of America, uh, that there would be a regional bias against the South because only citizens would vote, and you know the whole question of the racial composition of the South, therefore, would be a regional disadvantage. That's an important, that's an important objection. I don't think it's the most important one. The decisive objection, uh, to my way of thinking, uh, is the idea not that, not that the electorate would canter after a demagogue. Let's try to think of a random example who you know, might come into mind. You know, not, not too hard these days. Um, it was rather more the problem of having an uninformed electorate that would be inclined to favorites on voting. So that if you want to have popular election, you probably would need some, some round of runoffs, you know, maybe in a kind of proto, pro, pro French or Brazil, Brazilian model, but something I think difficult to conceive. So in a sense, there's kind of an information problem. You assume a lot of favorite sun candidates. And, um, you know, that's why Madison says, apropos of the Electoral College, that everyone's second vote would actually be the, you know, uh, be, be the collective first vote. And yeah, uh, popular election doesn't work. The other, the obvious alternative is to have a congressional election that solves the that solves the information problem. By definition, you cannot. I mean, some people might quibble with this today, but by definition, you can't have a more informed electorate than the national legislature, right? I mean, to get there, you have to be reasonably sophisticated politically. Problem is, I think there's also a theory of ambition, uh, which, in some extent, may have been unique to the presidency in 18th century terms. Um, that uh, the best incentive to good behavior would be the promise of re-election. And if you, had, if you had a congressional election and you want the president to be constitutionally and politically independent of the executive, uh, what's to stop the president from becoming the toady of Congress? And under kind of conventional separation of powers thinking, circa 1787, 1788, um, that wouldn't be good. The Electoral College succeeds by default. It does so at the very end of the convention, after what Madison called tedious of reiterated discussions. There are several, a couple of big cycles where, 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 where the framers uh, work their way through this. It had the obvious invention, uh, it, had the, excuse me, it had the obvious attraction, it's finally designed, of combining the two I don't like to use the word compromises here, but the, the two great decisions over representation uh, where the kind of, you know, a popular vote with the three-fifths rule embedded in it um, would be efficacious in the first round. Uh, and in the second round, you know, should no majority be attained, which as George Mason said might happen 19 times out of 20, uh, then the equal state vote uh, would, would, uh, would, 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 would come to apply. Um, on the other hand, on, on other issues, the framers simply defaulted the issue to the states. I mean, you kind of wish they'd spend two or three more days working out something about the mode of election, but instead that, that option was defaulted to the state legislatures, maybe because they were tired and wanted to go home, maybe because they really hadn't thought through right. uh, how, the, you know, how the electoral system uh, would operate. So I think, you know, I think it's important to have this in mind when we consider the whole history of this, uh, this institution. And I think it's, again, what makes, you know, you know, books, you know books like Ned's and Alex Kazar's book, which I guess is going off to the publisher, he, uh, he says on Monday. Uh, he'll tell us more in the, you know, in, the, in, the, in the next session. So I think it's really important to be able to reconstitute the history of, of how the institution uh, evolved. Those are my primary historical comments. I, I want to make two substantive comments. <clears throat> um, one I'm, I'll, I'll make in passing. I, 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 you know, that makes a great point about the importance of getting majorities. I'm not sure I'm convinced of it. Uh, I'm not sure you know, that I think the third party effect uh, in selective states is important as he makes out. I mean, and I think we'd want to know more about who third party voters actually are. They might well not turn out. You know, if, you know, uh, if, you know, I mean, obviously they're voting out of dissatisfaction with the existing set of choices. So, you know, what, you know, so whether they're voters, whether we should have a redistribution, to me that's an open question. And I think, you know, your concern is with, you know, more episodic events as, as opposed to the systemic flaws of the Electoral College as it's currently <laughs> constituted. I mean, it's legitimate in certain elections to worry about this. So that's objection number one. Objection number two goes back to the idea of the federal republic which it seems to me is essential to your argument. Uh, and I'm very skeptical about this. I mean, it's often said that, you know, we, you know by definition, we have a state-based system. Uh, but to say that the presidential election system represents the existing, you know, our existing federal structure is not the same thing as saying it actually advances the principles of federalism. 
right? I mean, necessarily, we conduct elections according according to a federal principle. That's fine. I mean, you know, but it's uh, you know how it actually affects or promotes federalism to me remains uh, you know a deeply problematic statement. I would think at the national level, federalism is adequately protected by the, the existing modes of representation in Congress, you know, with or without senators being elected. The more fundamental point I want to make here is that, and I, I try to explain this, you know, shana 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 la shana year to year, uh, with you know, with, with 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 my students whenever I talk about this. Um, our electoral system does represent the belief that the size of a, in, in a kind of inverse sense, that the size of a state matters uh, in terms of the sway it should have in in in, in the presidential in the presidential system. But we never vote on the basis of the size of the state in which we live, except when we're voting on rules of voting. Size makes no difference. I mean, so the electoral system, because of the centauri bump, necessarily, to some extent, is a function of size. Size makes no difference in how we actually vote. It is not what Madison would regard as one of the interests that has to be reconciled. And go back to Federalist 10, interestingly, it's big omission in Madison's theory. Um, all the preferences we, we have, all the preferences which determine how citizens vote, are essentially individualistic in nature. Now, those preferences are, di are distributed differently across the states. Some states are competitive because, just as a matter of circumstance, they have to be evenly divided in terms of you know, the working distribution of preferences. So I, I, I'm not convinced that the federal principle, I mean, it is, it is one of your concerns, I think, to, you know, to maintain, you know, to kind of abide by the logic of federalism. As I think about it, it's a kind of trivial, secondary, really, you know, really inconsequential issue. Um, uh, we take our interests with us. I mean, I've lived, I voted in Massachusetts, I voted in Illinois, I voted in New York, and I voted in California. I'm, I'm kind of basically a big state guy, and I'm, native, you know, <laughs> I'm a native Cook County Democrat, a native Chicago Cubs fan, and that's about three quarters of my identity, I suppose, along with religious affiliation. But the, you know, that's what determines how I vote. Wherever I live, if I move to Wyoming, God forbid, tomorrow, I probably, you know, I, you know, I, you know, and I visited it, so I've been there. I probably still, you know, actually said to Senator Barone, so why does Wyoming have two votes in the Senate? He couldn't give me an answer, but the guy's kind of stiff <laughs> if you ever beat him. In any case, um, you know, it just you know, it just seems to me that the whole federal principle is is a misconceived way to think about the problem. Except you want to have a feasible solution. I want to have a national popular vote, you know, achieved by Article Five Amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I second everything you just said, Jack. Um, showing on the importance of federalism to the debate, you know, we have to figure that out. That's at the core and often gets, gets ignored. Um, I, I disagree a little bit about Madison and regionalism. I'm not so sure that that's important at all, in fact. Um, so, um, I'm coming in as the historian of the slightly later period, going on to the middle of the 19th century, and my re historical reflections on what you have to say, because I think history in some ways bears out your argument, in some ways it complicates your argument, and in some ways that actually works against your argument. So let me explain why that is. Um, first of all, I want to commend you for something that you don't do in the book. <laughs> it's not often that you get to do that, but I'm happy to do it. But it might, you know, it might raise some hackles because I, I, you do not say, you do not buy the argument that the original electoral college was designed by the framers as a slaveholder's ploy to protect slavery. I like to commend you also because you say that the revised electoral college, ratified in 1804 by the by the states, was designed as a slaveholder's ploy to protect slavery. Either, I mean, I just think that the. The documentary evidence on this is so crystal clear that that's just not the case. It's not an apology for slavery. It's not an apology for the framers. There's nothing, what, let alone happened in 1884. It's just not true. So, so I commend you on just staying away from all of that. Um, and I think the important point that you make from my standpoint is how important what happened in 1803-1804 actually was. I mean, people forget that. People go back to the framers all the time, talk about that electoral college. It's not the electoral college we have. That's very important. Also important, I think, is how you bring out, and I, I, I commend you to read this, this chapter of it, the, the seriousness of the debate. I mean, we don't, we don't always think of congressional debates as you know, elevated political theory, but it's pretty close. 
in, in the House and in the Senate. Um, it's really very strong on what the character of this republic ought to be. Should it be democratic or not democratic? And it's as good a, you know, if I was to give a undergraduates a, you know, a, a debate to look at, that would be the one, I think. Um, and I agree that what the Jeffersonians are up to there, the Republicans are up to there, is not simply to get Je Jefferson reelected, which, which they really didn't have to do anyway because they were going to win by a landslide in 18-4. So, so they're, they're, they're doing, but it had to do with the idea of majority rule. You know, they really did want to do that. Um, and, and so it's possible to see the 12th Amendment in that way. And as having not only, I mean, it's partisan, but it's also principled. People don't often think that you can be both. They were in, in 18.3, 18.4. There's one little thing I want to add to it, though, which has to do with the character of the politics, not just majoritarianism, but the character of the politics that they were envisaging and what the Federalists were so scared of. And it comes out of a speech, one of the speeches in the Senate by a man named Samuel White, who was a sort of traditional, very conservative uh, Delaware Federalist. If you know about Delaware Federalism, you know what I'm talking about. But he says, he said during the debate, ours is a country of politicians, uh, a country of politicians. And from the nature of our government must continue to be so, a place where the humbled and the exalted have a right to express their sentiments. But what he's worried about is that these decisions are going to be made by partisan politicians abroad in the country, right? In private circles, in, um, in caucus, in clubs, in coffee houses, in bar rooms. You know, that's where the great constitutional questions are to be settled. That's the fear, that there's going to be this kind of democratic style of politics as well as the majoritarian politics. <clears throat> and the Jeffersonians don't mind that so much. I mean, not all of them like it, but they don't mind it as much. And that's at stake here, too, is the character of our politics. And I think you could, you could, you could, you could stress that a little bit more. Um, I mean, in the book, this big switch after 1845, where basically, you know, I won't go into the details, but the way in which we pick presidents and vice presidents has changed. You do it together, not separately. It's going to make it much more likely that you're going to have a party competition for the presidency, OK? The Jacksonians kind of messed that up you know, according to the book, by making plurality rather than total and absolute majority the basis for giving electoral college votes in the states. Okay, I you know I think it's a little bit much to pin it on the Jacksonians broadly construed. I mean, Andrew Jackson didn't believe in all that; he had a whole other way of doing it. So, a little bit more fuzzing up I would do in all of that in terms of the politics of it. But, but the real question is, how did this work out in practice? And uh, here I'm going to give you a little talk about the election of 1844. I know a burning question, something you've been thinking about all the time. The election of 1844, the bombshell of 1844, as I put it in a recent article. All right. So what happened in 1844? In 1844, um, the Democrats nominate James K. Polk in a very con after a very contentious convention. And the Democrats, uh, sorry, the Whigs um, nominate Henry Clay, as they had expected to, to, to nominate Henry Clay. Running as a third party candidate in the North is the not so fledgling, it's their second time around, abolitionist party, the Liberty Party, which had nominated James G. Bernie for the presidency. Okay, so these three people, I mean, Bernie's not going to get any votes in the, in the South. I don't even think he's on the ballot in the South. But, you know, but he is going to get some votes in the North. The Whigs are thought of as less pro slavery than the Democrats. Okay, so if you're a kind of you know anti-slavery person, kind of you kind of want to get Clay in rather than Polk. Except along come these abolitionists who are saying both parties are you know corrupt because both parties have slaveholders in them. Both parties support slavery in effect, which is true, which is true. I mean, one of the problems with going against the Liberty Party people too much is I probably would have voted for Bernie in 1844, um, but that's another matter. Um, in the key state of New York, right, big swing state, Bernie takes enough votes away, supposedly, from Clay to, um, to elect Polk, to give Polk New York's votes. OK, is that all clear? It's a third. It's, he's the Ralph Nader, so sort of. It looks like the Ralph Nader in Florida, right? There's no butterfly ballot. There's no Pat Buchanan. Hold that aside. Bernie looks like Nader. OK, all right. And that's the way it gets written about a lot, except and this is the point I really want to make, is that presidential politics are more than just elections. And they're more than just the numbers that we count up at elections. And there was much more going on in that vote in New York than can be measured by the, in the usual way. I mean, it's true the Whigs 
you know, the Whigs were ticked off. Everybody from Clay to Abraham Lincoln, they're all angry, right? They lost the election. Who do we blame for this? And they blame Bernie and the, and the, and, and the people in New York. Right? They all do that. Not Bernie Sanders. Not Bernie Sanders. Sorry. <laughs> I, forgot where I, I forgot where I am. Right? James G. Bernie. B-I-R-N-E-Y. Yes. Right. From now on, for the next 10 minutes, he's the only Bernie that exists. Okay? Right. Right. Feel the B-I-R-N. Yeah, feel the B-I-R-N. How are you going to run on that? All right. Um, and so, the, the, what, what, but the point of the book is that, in fact, the wrong man got elected. Right, because by Jeffersonian, um, you know, the, by, by the standards of the electorate, okay, he's the wrong guy. Okay, maybe the Whigs thought that they Whigs, you know, they lost. They thought the wrong man was elected. Pro Whig historians also jump on this, and they they love this. You know, my friend Dan Howe loves this. Why? Because it makes the Whigs look really good. <laughs> because they were the more abolitionist party, which is not untrue, which is true, but they lost because they were better on slavery than the Democrats, who were really, you know, the Southern wing especially, were nasty on slavery, okay? All right. Sort of. I just want to caution everybody in thinking about the Electoral College today. I'm talking historically, but in thinking about all of this, not to get, not to ignore the broader context of how politics is actually operating, okay? And here's the example from 1844. James K. Polk was the nominee in 1844, but he shouldn't have been. You know, if there was the real, no if the right nominee had gotten it, it wouldn't have been James K. Polk, it would have been Martin Van Buren. I mean, that's not an exciting alternative necessarily. But John C. Calhoun basically screwed Martin Van Buren out of the nomination. I won't go into all the details. And the reason was that Martin Van Buren had come out against the immediate annexation of Texas. That was the key issue in that election the immediate annexation of Texas. Clay was against it. Van Buren came out against it, too. This was the, quote, quote, anti-slavery view. You might have had three anti-slavery pe uh, people running as president in 1844, but John C. Calhoun would not let that happen. That has to be brought into, in, 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 into the story for all kinds of reasons. For one reason, Van Buren was very popular in the state of New York because it was his state. He ran the politics of the state of New York for a very long time. His faction in New York state politics, they were called the barn burners. And they had been screwed out of the nomination in Baltimore, I think it was in Baltimore, in 1844. They're ticked off. They don't go to the polls. So it's not just Bernie who's taking votes away from Clay. It's that lots of people are not going to be turning up for Polk in quite the same way. You have to balance those things out. That's a part of the story that has to be there. More than that, and here's where the Whigs don't look so good. The Whigs might have been relatively OK on the issue of slavery. They were not relatively OK on the issue of nativism. And in 1844, nativism was at the center of New York state politics, particularly in New York City where the nativists were working out a Whig alliance. And Henry Clay keeps writing letters saying, what are they doing in New York? They're going to cost me the election because they're coming out as nativists. What the Democrats do is they bring thousands of Irish voters to the polls in New York City. Now, some of them may have been of dubious legality. Nevertheless, they're so angry at the Whigs that they, there's an outpouring of Irish votes. And you can see it. The numbers are extraordinary. I haven't done the arithmetic to figure out if that's how decisive that was. But it was there. So, so my point of all of that is simply to say that, I mean, John Quincy Adams actually has a, reflects on all of this. And he says there are a million reasons why, why, why Clay lost. You know, and, and Bernie was one of them, but he was not the only one. He talks about and the dotage of Andrew Jackson. And he talks about who got Polk the nomination in part. He talks about the nativists. He talks about a whole bunch of things that are happening. So it's not as simple as, as, as you know, political outcomes are not as simple as looking at, you know, the, 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 how the parties voted, the vote, and how it lands up with the Electoral College. That's my only caution in thinking about the present and the future, is that maybe politics are bigger than what we are talking about, and that we cannot, you know, um, um, imagine that uh, fixing the Electoral College one way or another, and I have, I have sort of agnostic on all this. I don't have, a, I don't have a, a, a dog in this fight. But, but that it's not going to have the same kind of you know, effect 
if you take if you if you ignore the larger political context and what's going on, and that's that's just a cautionary note that I'd like to to raise to, to everybody, in fact, in thinking about this issue. Okay, Thanks. that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Same. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, I'm fundamentally, in my heart, a data guy and a scientist. I was told I was going to be able to show slides. <laughs> and if you'd like to see the slides that I was going to show, you're welcome to go to election.princeton.edu, where I've posted them for your enjoyment. And I'm going to be looking at them while I talk. Um, let's see. So let me um, make some general observations about the Electoral College and how, uh, how these ideas look. Uh, as originally framed in your book very ably, uh, originally in the time since that time, uh, and taking into account some of the things that you talked about, but I want to take it in a slightly different direction. I want to see, uh, interrogate your ideas as they collide with historical data and with modern conditions. Uh, and as a numbers guy, I'm going to talk about some of these things that you mentioned in your book in those contexts. Let me just make some general points. The reason that we're, of course, here today, I think, uh, is that there's no clear way for the majority to exert its will in American politics. Um, the smallest of these offenses, in some ways, is, uh, is the House of Representatives, which partisan gerrymandering has distorted somewhat, but there are mechanisms to start moving that towards more equity, uh, and I'm pretty strongly engaged in that. Um, Jack votes in states that are not very competitive, and so in California, in Massachusetts, in Wyoming, if he goes that direction. <laughs> All these are states where individual voters don't really matter that much. Uh, and so that's a, a reflection of the idea that the majority has no clear to exert as well. I should say, by the way, that I think, if I understand my history correctly, and in front of historians, I should be careful. Um, all those rectangular states were carved up uh, to give one party as many vote, many senators as possible. Right? Why do we have two Dakotas? I, I, I love my friends from the Dakotas, but like I think one Dakota would be <laughs> would be sufficient. And so, but but my friends from the Dakotas have four senators, uh, and that's that would just be one example of how these mechanisms get baked in, right? Entrenched minority rule uh, get baked into the system. And today, of course, we're talking about the presidency. Um, let me start from Ned's idea of uh, the, this Jeffersonian rule of wanting majority rule, uh, wanting a majority in individual states. Um, I think that I would give that pretty good marks for um, a diagnostic for both failure to achieve a majority in individual states, also um, uh, uh, the third party threat. Uh, but I would characterize it a little bit as a diagnostic and perhaps uh, a bit of a nostalgic wish for majority rule. And let me talk about some problems posed by the Electoral College uh, and, um, and talk about uh, and, and view that wish through that lens. So first let me list a few problems as I see it with uh, the Electoral College. Uh, again, I want to just interject here that I think of elections as being very nationalized because of communications, uh, these favorite son effects, favorite daughter effects are not no longer as strong as they used to be. And so I, I personally, uh, viewing through a modern lens, see elections as being somewhat nationalized. So with that said, uh, here are some problems with the modern electoral college. Uh, there are four of them that I'm going to mention. One is mismatch between popular vote and electoral vote. Another is failure to build broad-based coalitions. Third, susceptibility to interference. And fourth, disempowerment disempowerment of voters in partisan-leading states, uh, which I touched upon a moment ago. Uh, and I would say that this uh, solution of requiring a majority vote in a majority of states um, partially addresses some of these, but not really all of them. And I just uh, personally take the position that, that a somewhat complex solution isn't going to address all those problems. Now, in historical context, we've heard about elections going back to 1844 and earlier. The way I would characterize it is as follows. The reason that we're hearing about this problem now is that we are in an age of closely contested elections. So the last time that, uh, in my view, the popular vote has failed, uh, there was a period of a lot of them, uh, well, a lot of them, several of them, Rutherford Hayes and Benjamin Harrison in the late 19th century during the first Gilded Age. And that was a time of racial division, 
technological disruption, increasing inequality, and deep partisanship. And I hope that sounds familiar to you because now we live in a time of modern elections that are very close. By close, I mean the popular vote is within about three percentage points or less. That's happened repeatedly in the last five elections. And we, of course, live in a time of racial division, te technological disruption, um, increasing inequality, and deep partisanship. Now, one could ask, when have we not lived in a time of racial division? But I would say that those issues have come to the foreground as voting rights come under threat. If one looks at these things mathematically, um, the popular vote winner, if one does modeling of these things, uh, the time when the popular vote fails us is when elections are within about three percentage points in terms of the popular vote. And when the popular vote is within three percentage points between the major candidates, as it was between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, between uh, Al Gore and George W. Bush, uh, and also in the first Gilded Age, under those conditions, about one in three elections will go to the person who won fewer votes. Okay, and so that's really the problem. And so I think the, the thing that we're concerned about is that. So certainly I agree with, uh, with Ned about uh, that level of diagnosis. Now I want to point out that currently we already have a system in which some kind of broad national consensus is necessary. And I just want to use the Clinton versus Trump election as an example of that. For Hillary Clinton to have won more votes than Donald Trump in the 2016 election required votes that she won in 41 states and the District of Columbia. And so she won plenty of votes in California, New York, Florida, and Texas, but there were dozens of other states that were necessary. And in order to have more people vote for her than for Donald Trump, it was necessary to win states down to little Rhode Island, right? So 41 states in DC, and the state that puts her over the top is Rhode Island. So I think that there's already a mechanism in our age of communication for, uh, for requiring some kind of national, uh, not quite consensus, but a national outpouring of support for one candidate. There's, um, there's some issues having to do with battleground states, and I'm not 100% sure that, uh, that a Jeffersonian rule would actually address those. Uh, an example is vulnerability to hacking. Currently, uh, it takes uh, as few as 600 votes flipped in Bush v. Gore, 9,000 in 1976 between Carter and Ford, uh, up to uh, around 100,000 for Nixon versus Humphrey, Bush versus Kerry, and Trump versus Clinton. That's about how many votes it takes to flip the electoral college. Had we a national popular vote, and this is just the nerdy, simple solution of counting votes and finding out who wins more votes than the other, uh, that number of votes uh, can be small. It can be 100,000, as in Kennedy versus Nixon. But it also would require up to, say, 3 million votes. That's how many votes would need to be flipped to reverse the popular plurality or majority of uh, George W. Bush versus John Kerry or Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. So I think a national popular vote uh, has the advantage of simplicity. Uh, we can get into the technology of it a little bit, uh, but I really do think that, that, uh, that it has uh, less of a Rococo nature. So um, another problem that we have to think about when thinking about modern conditions and practical issues is this battleground state phenomenon. Uh, you expressed a wish of wanting uh, a particular reform in battleground states. I should point out that battleground states change over time. Uh, unless you're in Ohio, you're not assured of being a battleground state. Oh, okay. Okay. We've okay. lost that status. It's yeah. all Wisconsin. <laughs> well, but, but the thing is, but that's this year. And so I think that, uh, I think that w if one wants a practical reform, one should think a little bit about how to achieve it, uh, given the fact that conditions are probably going to be nationalized elections for the foreseeable future. Battleground states may change. Uh, and what we're really looking for is a way to fix uh, close elections. Um, so examples of problems uh, are that currently major candidates ignore all but a few states. Uh, the Dakotas did not get visited in 2016. Idaho did not get visited. Uh, uh, Wyoming did not get visited. California got visited once. Uh, Massachusetts did not get visited. This is all during the general election campaign. Who did get visited? North Carolina, 55 times. Ohio, 48 times. Florida, 71 times. Pennsylvania, 54 times, right? Uh, Wisconsin was actually not recognized so much as being a central battleground, so visited all a total of 14 times. Um, ignored citizens don't participate. In battleground states, the rate of voting is higher. In states that are not competitive, the rate of voting is lower. Um, this percolates to disempowerment of specific communities. We've heard about non-white uh, communities who don't get uh, empowered. 
Other communities also get disempowered. A white community that doesn't uh, get very much power is Mormons. If you calculate the power of individual votes over the presidential outcome in terms of probability, Mormons have about one eighth the power of uh, Americans on average. So, you know, Mormons, Puerto Ricans, uh, uh, various people of color, uh, that disempowerment, I think, does not necessarily get fixed. So, um, so my take on this is that. Um, is that it seems like this uh, desire for a Jeffersonian approach doesn't entirely um, uh, translate well to a practical policy. Uh, my take on this is that one could think about practical forms built upon the National Popular Vote Compact, uh, upon experiments currently being done with, uh, with ranked choice voting, so we can see that experiment starting to play out. That has the advantage of something that can start uh, in the laboratories of the states and then uh, uh, percolate from state to state. Um, so I think there are ways to approach this problem. I think the Je Jeffersonian rule, let's call it, is an excellent diagnostic, uh, but not necessarily um, a good prescription for going to the future. Uh, and just to point out back to Sean's point uh, about uh, 1844, uh, I should say that one of the problems right now is that we're in a situation where, where in close elections, no one factor matters yet every factor matters. And so we can always point to individual hypotheticals as being, well, the election would have turned out differently had we done that. And, and I think that it's easy to go down into the spiral of wanting to fix smaller and smaller things. And just the, the, the scientist in me wants to pop back up to, how about find out who got more votes? Uh, and so that would be my somewhat uh, boneheaded uh, <laughs> suggestion. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and be a part of such a distinguished panel. Um, I feel compelled to verify that Sam's slides are fantastic. <laughs> um, and also that um, Jack, <laughs> Jack mentioned that he's from Chicago. Um, and so I have to say he did not vote in all of those states at the same time. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, so for my comments, I want to focus on the extent to which the 12th Amendment changed our understanding of what republicanism requires. I mean, why this matters in thinking about the normative implications of Ned's book, which as the um, only other law professor on the panel, you have to think about the normative. Uh, the, the Guarantee Clause imposed a Republican form of government on the states and as such has significant implications for the construction of not only state political systems, but the federal system as well since part of its structure was derivative of these state systems. Um, Republicanism was essentially held out as the ideal, but it was ill-defined during the founding period. There has never been a consistent and enduring definition of Republicanism. Plato once defined a republic as, quote, a well-ordered community ruled by, quote, guardians who in their whole life show the greatest eagerness to do what is for the good of their country and the greatest repugnance to do what is against their interests. Aristotle and Cicero similarly viewed any government that works for the good of the whole as a republic. Later writers like Montesquieu would adopt a definition of republicanism that could encompass a monarchy, an aristocracy, or a democracy, provided that the ruling class acts on behalf of the majority. Like the political theorists from whom they drew inspiration, Madison and the other founding fathers were not pressed to develop a clear definition of republicanism, seeking only to rule out a, mon a monarchy or a hereditary class of rulers, but with provided few specifics. Um, generally speaking, this generation treated the concept as unnecessary of explanation and ingrained in the psyche of the young republic. In the Federalist 39, Madison described a republic as a, quote, government which derives its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people and is administered by of officers holding their offices during pleasure, for a limited time, or during good behavior. He concluded that, quote, it is essential for such a government that it be derived from the great body of the society and not from an inconsiderable proportion or a favorite class of it. Otherwise, a handful of tyrannical nobles exercising their oppressions by a delegation of their powers might aspire to the rank of Republicans and claim for their government the honorable title of a republic. Madison was not alone in thinking that republicanism equated to some form of majority rule. There was almost universal agreement that, in addition to obligating the federal government to come to the aid of states facing rebellion, the Guarantee Clause required that states enfranchise some portion of their population. But Republicanism's historical connection to monarchy led many opponents of the Constitution to question this new government that the founding generation sought to create. Writing under the pseudonym the Columbian Patriot, one such opponent referred to a republic as a, quote, many-headed monster. 
that democratic branch with the features of aristocracy and the extravagance of nobility pervading the minds of many of the candidates for office. While the Colombian patriot would insist that a republic was contrary to the fundamental principle of free government, those who would later govern the new nation under the party label of federalists sought to build a government in which the diffusion of power through structural principles like federalism and separation of powers would prevent any attempts to establish a monarchy in either the states or the federal government. From debates over the scope of the guarantee clause, one can distill that republicanism promoted a type of majority rule that required elected officials to first act virtuously, um, second, for the good of the whole, and third, periodically stand for election to be held account for any misdeeds by some portion of the population. The requirement of at least nominal participation by the people likely preclude, precluded the establishment of a monarchy, dictatorship, aristocracy, or permanent military rule, even if through valid majority vote. With the 12th Amendment, however, one no longer had to distill the principles of republicanism underlying our system of government. The amendment made it more explicit. The amendment, if Ned is right that it was meant to prevent a situation in which the president emerges with less than 50% of the vote in any state that is crucial to his or her electoral college win, it clarified the majoritarianism that had been alluded to in our founding documents. In 1787, it was clear that majoritarianism did not have to reflect the preferences of the national majority. But the 12th Amendment clarified that it did not have to reflect the majority of the state either, just the will of the majority of the voters. Majoritarianism required the president to garner the support of those who held the political power in the state, either through the voter-selected state legislature that cho chose electors or through electors selected by voters directly. Requiring the president to be a preference of a compound majority of majorities illustrated which people actually mattered for purposes of defining the major majoritarianism inherent in Republican principles, the voters. In important ways, we the people was actually we the voters. In clarifying which majority matters, Ned's book shows that the Jeffersonians, through the 12th Amendment, assume that the best way to ensure that the president is the preference of a compound majority of majorities is through the vehicle of political parties. Not only were parties the way to gauge which candidates enjoyed majority support among voters in a particular state, Ned is clear that the system is ill-equipped to deal with third-party spoilers, instead envisioning a winner that emerged from one of the two major parties because it will be easier for that individual to amass the support that the Jeffersonian experiment envisioned. In the elections of 1844, 1884, maybe 1992, definitely 2000, and possibly 2016, the president who emerged as the winner would not have been victorious but for the presence of third party spoilers and increased political polarization. Instead, the Jeffersonian ideal was that presidents have the stamp of legitimacy that comes with being a preference of the majority in the states responsible for his or her electoral college win. And oftentimes this structure was undermined because the system could not accommodate third party spoilers who siphoned away votes from the candidate who was the obvious Jeffersonian choice and would otherwise reach this threshold. Notably, the obvious Jeffersonian choice was always a major party candidate. Ned's book shows that parties are not just responsible for conveying the choices of a subset of the electorate. The 12th Amendment created a structure designed to facilitate the ability of the major party with the most support to choose the president. Even if parties were not fully formed at the founding, and republicanism was a nascent idea that nonetheless had wide support, by 1803 this was certainly not the case. The 12th Amendment clarified the meaning of republicanism embraced in 1787, centering on a type of voter-focused majority rule that was facilitated through the two major parties and that conflated majoritarianism with major party preferences. This was a huge change from a constitution which was, at least initially, anti-party. There are a couple of normative implications of this notion of political party as a proxy for majoritarianism, one of which I hate, if I'm being honest, and the other I am more receptive to. First, Perhaps there is something to the idea of states being able to legislate in the interest of protecting the two-party system. The Supreme Court has recognized this as a legitimate state interest, and the 12th Amendment seemed to be crafted with something similar in mind. I hate this idea. <laughs> However, and more importantly in my view, if parties are our best translation of the majoritarianism that undergirds our system of Republican government, and Ned's history of the 12th Amendment seems to suggest that this is the case, then it makes no sense to ever treat these entities as private associations that have constitutional rights like people. I love this idea. 
The Supreme Court has found that political parties have First Amendment rights, but arguably this reading of the 12th Amendment provides stronger support for the white primary cases, which struggle to create a framework that would prevent political parties from excluding otherwise qualified individuals from their primaries on the basis of race. The struggle emerged because it was difficult for the court to conceptualize the party as a constitutional actor equivalent to the state. This conceptual difficulty actually made it possible for the court to conceive of parties as private actors in other situations, including California Democratic Party versus Jones, in which it found, found that the blanket primary violated the First Amendment rights of political parties by forcing them to associate with individuals whose views were hostile to the parties. But if parties are the primary way to express the majoritarianism of the republic, and the 12th Amendment was adopted with that understanding, then it makes no sense to give parties carte blanche to exclude if they are private, as if they are private individuals exercising their right not to associate. The 12th Amendment makes it clear that they are, for all intents and purposes, government actors subject to both the restrictions and the benefits of the Constitution. Is this a reason to keep the current system? No, for all the reasons that Ned details in his book. Um, but Ned's majority vote requirement in particular would address some of the concerns raised by the allocation of electors in a way um, that is contrary to the will of the voters or that results in the election of a non-majority preferred candidate, a distinct possibility in the current system. But even with Ned's proposed changes, the two major parties remain the vehicles through which we translate majoritarianism. Put into the side the need to expand the universe of voters who comprise the majority, um, an, issue, an issue that naturally follows if we accept that majoritarianism means a majority of the voters. We should, as, as Ned shows, update the Electoral College to better reflect its majoritarian foundations. But the case law should also reflect that political parties are important constitutional actors who facilitate the levers of political power in this country. Ned's normative suggestion would further reduce the options that voters have to a binary choice, further cementing the two major parties in the electoral scheme. Thank you. That was great. Um, so what I thought we'd do um, is if I, I take a few minutes just to kind of react to some things that were said, hopefully very few, then give the panelists a chance to react to my reactions if they'd like to, and then open it up so that we can get some input in Q&A. Um, so real quick, uh, and I probably won't get to all the things that would be worth saying. Thank you all, by the way, for these very um, important and, and, and valuable comments. Uh, Starting, with Jack, with the idea of the federalism or the extent to which the Electoral College should reflect federalism principles. You know, my own normative preference, just to be clear, would be a constitutional amendment to replace the Electoral College with some form of national popular vote based on a majority winner, not a plurality winner. And I'm an Article 5 guy like you are and don't think the compact is the right way to do it. Um, so. So just to be clear about that sort of normative first preference, so the whole point of the book is not to argue what would be the best system in a utopian world. The point of the book is to try to understand the system we actually have, why there's this kind of disequilibrium or schizophrenia within the system, try to understand its own normative premises and values, and then recalibrate the system to avoid these anomalies that developed later on, even though Andrew Jackson didn't agree with them, but they did develop, and, and, and so recalibrate the system towards its own purposes. So I don't accept, you know, I, I'm less of a federalist believer than the authors of the 12th Amendment, but that's the system that they, they gave us. I think we could say more about that, but I think that's, that's the, the basic point there. Um, uh, I, I complete, Sean, I completely take your point about the messiness of history in general, of 1844 in particular, of the move in the Jacksonian period that wasn't Jackson himself and all that. I think that's all absolutely true. For the point of the present, I, I think the critical thing to keep in mind is not to have a definitive answer. Was Ralph Nader a spoiler in 2000, yes or no? Was the combination of Gary Johnson and Jill Stein a spoiler in 2016, yes or no? Was James Burney a spoiler in 1840? The point is that not knowing the answer to that is a problem. We ought to, we ought to have definitive winners that authentically speak for the electorate. And we do not have a system that can tell us what the electorate really wanted when there are significant 
third party or independent candidates. And significance, in this sense, isn't Teddy Roosevelt in 1912 or Ross Perot in 1992. Significance could be even 3%, 5% if it's making a difference in the kinds of close races that Sam is talking about. And so just to think about this psychologically now, everybody in this room probably remembers the national freakout that occurred when the idea was that, that Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz was thinking about running. Um, because people instantly processed the possibility that his presence in the race might have an effect uh, and, right, and, and, and mess up what would otherwise be an up or down two-party two choice. That's the insight that we should keep, and that freakout should exist even if he, out of the goodness of his heart, says, oh, I'm not going to do it this, this time, because other people might not have the goodness of their heart. And... Again, just think of it, as I understand the current environment, the Libertarian Party is, tr is flirting with the idea of nominating either Lincoln Chafee, a former governor and senator from Rhode Island, former Democrat, former Republican, former Independent, <laughs> or Justin Amash, former Republican Tea Party conservative from Michigan. The Libertarian Party has only a half a million members nationwide, but where they choose their own nominee could have a significant impact. It makes a difference to the fight between the Democrats and the Republicans, red team versus blue team, what the libertarians do. The system should be able to handle that. Um, the libertarians should allow a, a, a place in, in existence, and, 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 it, and it shouldn't be a problem that we just can't handle. So, so that's kind of, so we don't need to know for sure whether spoilers are spoilers, we just need a system that's that's capable of, of handling it. Um, you know that brings me to uh, Sam and the, the national popular vote and the ranked choice voting. And, and I'm trying to figure out how much agreement. And I appreciate all your points, but I think we're even more in sync than you perhaps agree. And if you believe that ranked choice voting is an experiment that states should take as methods for appointing their electors, because that is one obvious prescriptive outcome for the Jeffersonian analysis. It would be consistent with the original understanding of the 12th Amendment. Even, it, actually, Madison himself toyed with a proto version of, 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 a, of a rank system in the 1820s when he was observing anomalies that had, had developed. He didn't have a fully formed system of ranked choice voting like Maine has now adopted. but um, but. But that concept would be consistent with the Jeffersonian vision, and it, and it would be a really good thing if states experimented with that. But here's why I think all of you who are trying to think what we should do going forward, um, it is true that a state-based adoption of ranked choice voting cannot solve the battleground problem that Sam's pointed out. Insofar as our system has federalism built into it, whether we like it or not, you are going to have the problem that voters in California and Wyoming are not going to be part of one single national uh, count. They're going to, it's going to be divvied up state by state with, with that structure. Even if you think that the interstate compact is feasible to adopt, that the Supreme Court would accept it, and so therefore we can kind of defeat the federalism of the Electoral College through this surrogate alternative mechanism, which Jack and I don't want to do, but even if you think you could do that and get away with it, it doesn't solve the Howard Schultz freakout situation. Because if you're, if you're really concerned that the entry of somebody like Howard Schultz in a race could destabilize the disequilibrium of the race, that is true under our current plurality winner take all at the state level or under the national popular vote compact because what we can't do without an Article V amendment, unfortunately, is marry ranked choice voting with a uniform national electorate. I wish we could do it, but mechanically we can't do it because to do a full national ranked ballot, you need ranking ballots in all 50 states to get a full national ranking. So if only the compact states decide to adopt ranked choice voting, you're not getting a full national ranking. So the, the national popular vote compact plan that's under consideration calls for a plurality winner. Um, and that does not solve the Howard Schultz or the third party uh, uh, dynamic problem. So I just people should be aware of that as they think about alternatives. Finally, Fernita, absolutely brilliant. Um, 
I really want to take a lot of time to think about what you say. Um, but, but I love the fact that you're bringing into the discussion California uh, uh, Democratic Party versus Jones and the constitutional status of political parties. Because I, as, as important as fixing the Electoral College is, and it's hugely important because the presidency is important, for the overall concerns of our democratic governance in the future for reasons that Sam said, if we're sort of prioritizing reform, I would put at the top of the list fixing the polarization that exists with respect to US Senate elections and other kinds of elections as a result of how parties work with primary elections as they're currently conducted. And that's in part a feature of what I think is an incorrect and overly simplistic analysis of the role of the parties in the, in the California Democratic Party versus Jones. Um, there's a new anthology that Cambridge is publish, publishing about the party primary process that, that I've got a chapter in that is a bills on the book. And I, I won't go into the details here. But I, I think that should be the next cutting edge. Because whatever we do, whether it's through ranked choice voting or whatever, we are going to have to try to figure out the pathologies of internal competition within parties in the primary stage of the election and how that relates to pathologies that exist in the general election. And I think the legacy of 2016, again, I think a nonpartisan point, I just think it's observational that there were pathologies occurring in the intra-party competition for the nomination as well as pathologies that were occurring in the, in the general election. So thank you all. Any, anybody want to um, add comments, react to each other, uh, talk amongst yourselves before we go to the Q&A? I'll try to do this briefly. I, I just, you know, I've, I have not thought about this deeply, but I wonder if you move comprehensively towards ranked choice voting, whether that would contribute to the further dissolution of political parties because people could you know, vote their first preference. I think the one example I have in mind, somewhat different, but I think it's still opposite, is when the Israelis went to having a direct election of, uh, of a, pr a prime minister. I think it was back in the, I forget the exact dates, maybe back in the 90s, uh, somebody else might know. But one perceived consequence was that it actually contributed to the you know, destabilization, I think, of both Likud and the Labor Party and made the Israeli political matrix more difficult. So in fact, if you multiply the options on this basis, would that be a positive, would that be uh, helpful or inimical to the overall health of our political system? Yeah, no, it's a, yeah. a great question. Let's, let's sort of leave it as a question to, you know, for, for subsequent panels perhaps to address. And, but I, I do think all change has consequences. Yeah. Often unintended, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, in regard to the Israeli election system, I believe that the specific mechanism that leads to the fragmentation in Israel is the proportional representation system with a threshold. And, and to my knowledge, there is strategic voting on the part of Israeli voters, unusually strategic, but, um, but the fundamental core mechanism there is the PR mechanism. Let me put on the engineer hat for a second and say that my general reaction to our desire to fix these things with one solution is that sometimes you need a hammer, Sometimes you need a screwdriver, and sometimes you need a level. And I think that, roughly speaking, this Jeffersonian thing is a level to see whether things have gotten out of whack. And let me just describe like how the framework I think about when I think about all the ideas that you all have suggested. My take on it is that one might want to match the reform to the problem. And, to, and practically speaking, if you want to get that reform to happen, to use events to drive single state reforms. An example would be, OK, libertarians are going to nominate Lincoln Chafee, which seems somewhat, uh, had not occurred to me until you said it, but all right, sure. <laughs> Where is he now? <laughs> um, um, but OK, fine. Whatever they do, then use that to push for uh, a reform in an individual state. Channel your inner federalist, put on your uh, reformist federalist hat, and so use that to motivate people in a particular state. If, if, if Justin Amash gets nominated, then I think a bunch of red state voters might get a new interest in ranked choice voting, and so that might be good. Okay? And so the idea would be to use events to drive reform. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, I think spoiler effects can be addressed by ranked choice voting. Disempowerment of voters in, uh, in partisan states and also election security can be addressed by national popular voting, say, through the compact. Difficulty with recounts can be addressed through better election security and standardization of counting methods. 
And so at least in my mind, and I'm glad to be corrected, I think that each of these problems have specific fixes and you wouldn't want to go taking a, a you know, your level and try to like hammer things in and screw in screws with the level. I, I think one might want to be a little bit engineering about thinking about what reform fixes which problem. Anybody else or should we go to the audience? Go to the audience. In the back. So, so my comment slash question is mostly directed at the forward. It seems that uh, a lot of the paradigm that most of the speakers have uh, approached it through, but especially Edward Foley, is in regards to the two-party system being the original founder's intention and how do we make that work. But I don't see any reason why we need to stick to their original intention if the two-party system has become a situation where entrenched interests of uh, big corporations and whatnot know they get to win if they, if they only have to place two bets to win. So the whole terminology of spoilers and whatnot, ranked choice uh, voting, as Sam Wang has said, has a good potential for fixing the problem of spoilers. But we don't actually even know if they're spoilers. We know that the term spoiler makes a lot of people go, well, it's true they're not going to win. I got to vote for the lesser of two evils. But if there was, if it was a popular vote, you get a Ross Perot who got 19.4% of the vote. Next time he got less than 2% because everyone said, I can't waste my vote on a spoiler. He didn't get a single electoral college vote. But if it was a national popular vote, next time he might have won. I'm not saying that would have been a good or bad thing, but people would have said, there's a shot. I'm not wasting my vote. So um, I guess we went, we, we discussed two things. One was the electoral college stuff, which I don't see why a popular vote can't handle that. We've got the issue of spoiler. I don't see basically what Sam Wayne said, but I don't even understand why we want, why we should be happy that the two-party system is weakened. Because currently, the two-party system is a system where the voters don't get a say. They only have, OK, lesser of two evils. They don't get to actually say what they care about. Yeah, so thank you. Let me see if I can take a quick crack, crack at that and see if anybody else wants to chime in. Um, so I think the election of 1912 is particularly instructive in this regard, I, recognizing the caution that sometimes reforms have unintended consequences. I, I do think. One can tentatively predict that adopting ranked choice voting, um, either state by state or through an amendment at the na national level, would open up the space, as Jack suggested, for third parties and independents to be more robust. Because, for, so I think, for example, Michael Bloomberg would have entered the race in 2016 if ranked choice voting had been in place. I think he, he has wanted to think about ending the, the race, but he didn't want to be a spoiler. And he, uh, didn't turn out the way he wanted because he, he hoped Hillary Clinton would win. So he thought by withholding his role, he, but he thought that if he entered the race, he'd just give it to Trump. So, so if, you, if you put ranked choice voting in the mix, you're likely to see more people, potentially more parties, kind of come in to try to compete in the first stage process. I think, again, looking at France and, and other countries that do two-round systems for presidential elections would support that empirical prediction. Um, but the reason why I mentioned 1912, Teddy Roosevelt ran as a third party candidate, you know, his bull moose candidacy of the Progressive Party. This was after he'd, he'd been president. Remember, he, he anointed Taft as his successor, uh, and Taft was the incumbent president in the 1912 election. Um, and, and Roosevelt didn't like the fact that Taft was more conservative than he anticipated. Roosevelt was turning more progressive. And so he tried to get the nomination of the Republican Party away from his, from his protege, Taft. The Republicans stuck with Taft. Roosevelt bolted from the party and ran as a third candidate. Roosevelt actually did better than Taft. Wilson, Woodrow Wilson only wins in 1912 because of this three-way split. And in fact, if there had been a national ranked choice ballot, it's likely Roosevelt would have prevailed um, as he probably would have gotten, Taft would have been dropped out is the way the ranked choice voting mechanisms work, and most of Taft's votes would have gone, they would have gone to Wilson, they might have abstained, and this is somewhat of a guess, but that confirms the point that ranked choice voting um, 
is a way to unlock a two-party duopoly and give third parties or independents a genuine chance. Now, sometimes they may not make it to the second round, as it were, um, and they'll just fall by the wayside. But if they are like Roosevelt or perhaps Ross Perot, they might actually uh, uh, end up winning. Um, and, and in addition, even whoever does win, we still have the original count of what the actual populist can let, let me describe some consequences of natural experiments that we we're doing as a species with weakening of two-party systems. Let's see. So... Parties in the United States are weaker now because of campaign finance and also because, as we've seen in the last few elections, uh, party voters, kind of like reactor fuel that spill out of the vessel, and it's all over the place, and they go voting for Trump and stuff. And so, and so parties are weaker now, and so that means that 40% of Republican primary voters end up supporting Trump, so that's an interesting phenomenon that's out of step with party leaders. And so that's an example of, you know, I hate them. I hate the party, and so therefore I want to weaken it, so let's let the voters have a say. Another example of weakening of a two-party system is, um, in some sense, what's happening in the UK, where, uh, where there's division of opinion, and they as a nation seem to be paralyzed. And so they've kept first past the post, but they have a weakened party system. Uh, Israel has proportional representation, and so they have lots and lots of parties. And boy, that's really working out well for them. Um, and, and, and so I think it's, it's natural to dislike the fact that one is... Uh, uh, forced to currently support one of two major parties, but one should be careful about not liking a thing and then breaking it and throwing it out. I think that one should, generally speaking, take a little care before wanting to uh, toss something out the window. Um, we've got a lot of questions we have. Sorry. Sam, do you want to? Okay. So two, two quick observations. First, uh, I would encourage those who are loyal people here not to overlook for Anita's argument. This idea of reading the 12th Amendment as a constraint on First Amendment uberalis is one of the most creative constitutional arguments I've heard in a long time. This is great. Um, other observation. We tend to forget that parties and people respond to incentives. And so the incentives condition how people behave in the electoral arena. We can say, because of the electoral college, uh, the vote came out this way, and we can try to match, after the fact, how the popular vote did and how the electoral college vote did. I don't think that's the biggest distortion in our politics. The electoral college sets up the threshold question in a small number of battleground states, and Sam's slides demonstrate this very well, both in terms of turnout and in terms of how the candidates see the election. So I often ask my students, do you recall what the issue was in 2000 in the presidential election? Because that was a determinative moment in our politics. The Supreme Court came in, all that. That was the year that the Time magazine proclaimed the year of the shark, because there were two deaths in Florida. That was the year <laughs> that the candidates ran on the Social Security lockbox. Why did they do that? Because everybody knew the election was Pennsylvania and Florida. <coughs> and that's number one and two in terms of senior citizens in the population, as a percentage of the population. And so the distortion is not just at the outcome level, do we match the popular vote to the electoral college? The distortion is what part of the population gets engaged and over what issues. And um, so when we talk about critiques of the Electoral College, I think it's important to push back on deeper questions of the responsiveness of our elected leaders to conditions of popular sentiment and what parts of the population get engaged. So I'm watching the clock. I think technically we've reached the limit, but the good news is the conversation doesn't end. It only continues, and I look forward to hearing what the other panels say and what Q&A uh, brings to that to those panels. So thank you, co-panelists.